one person, 10 parts, 16 games, 288 bosses. And it all comes back to that. Who is this one person judging all of these bosses? He did a generalized list, gave off some pretty good hints in the countdown what games he likes and doesn't like, but we don't really know him because he's been doing this thing called respect all games equally. Sounds like a cookie guy, am I right? And I bet you're curious, what Zelda games do I prefer and which ones am I eh about? So in this video, I'm going to go through my top 7 teams personal Zelda games and as such, there are some rules you should know. So for the first time, I'm not focusing on being fair and trying to be the middle ground between the Zelda players. This is strictly my opinion. Opinions in the Zelda series are so cool because every time you meet a Zelda player, you get to hear what they specifically like from the series and what they don't. It makes for some very fascinating conversations and no two Zelda players have the same opinion about it. Which is awesome! No one's opinion is ever stupid. Mine is cool, and so is yours. And I love listening to every Zelda game countdown I've ever come across. It's an absolute joy to hear others talk about their Zelda favorites. I decided to keep the rankings simple. If there was one Zelda game I'd want to remove from the series, I would put it at number 17, and then the next one at number 16, and so on. Up to the top Zelda game I absolutely adore from the series. I'll go through each Zelda game and what I thought of it, and it doesn't need to get more complicated than that. Please note that I am not a status quo type of gamer. I won't put Ocarina of Time at number 1 just because it's the most popular game out there and Adventures of Link at the bottom because it's the black sheep. Expect any Zelda game to show up at any time. Every opinion is different and mine is no exception. One more thing before I begin, because I'm expressing my opinion, it may sound like at points I could be taking things too personally, or that I could be stomping on some toes who like more Zelda games than others, but please note that that isn't the case. I'm simply giving you my thoughts about the Zelda game. This is a fun countdown, countdowns are supposed to be fun, so let's have some fun going through my top 17 personal Zelda games. I'm assuming since this is at number 17 that you expect me to rip and tear this game into pieces, but no. I don't really hate anything that the Zelda series has done or have a problem with anything about their games in general. This isn't a like or hate list, this is more of a what interests me more, what interests me less type of list. I think there's a big line difference in saying that you don't care about it and hating it. Yep, so says the patient guy. With that being said, I'm pretty much saying that this game is the least interesting to me, and why is that? The simple reason is that nothing has ever interested me about it. Say anything about this game, it didn't fascinate me or pique my interest. Take your pick, the music, the gameplay, the controls, the dungeons, the graphics, nothing made me want to look at the screen twice. I've been around this game my entire life. At 5 years old, I watched my cousin play it through the first dungeon. Nothing. At 15 years old, I played it myself, and still nothing. And now at 25, I can only bear to play through the first dungeon, and that's me pushing my patience for boredom. This game's selling concept, a search and discovery feature without any map or clues, is an excellent concept, but not for me. I'm terrible at navigation and don't like getting lost in world maps. I always like having a general direction to go and I love exploring. That's why I like Zelda, but everything is too subtle, everything is too hidden, everything is too focused on guesswork. I can see why it's an excellent kickstarter to the series, but it's far from what I enjoy in video games for me personally. So no hate, just not for me. Now you're picturing that it has to be the graphics, right? It's got to be the graphics. I'm one of those guys, aren't I? To be honest, I don't know. This is the game where I have the most unknown mixed feelings about, which is why I don't enjoy being around this game because it forces me to think rather than enjoy the game. For example, the graphics. On the one side, there's my soft side that likes random and innovation, and then there's the other and pet peeve side that isn't used to seeing Link this way compared to the other Zelda games. It is a constant battle in my head, battling it out between my softer sides and pet peeves for video games, and it's enough to give me a headache and a sort of phobia for this game. This isn't just the graphics, there's the music, the sounds, it puts my mind into a war zone whenever this game is brought up. To add on to that, the music is high pitched flute music which constantly drives me insane, and everyone has noises they don't like hearing. Like with CJ for example. Make it stop! Please make the horrible background music go away! <sighs> That's better. 
The sounds in Link's voice drives me nuts! And finally, the sailing. Here we go. I don't like boats in video games because they create large, expansive worlds, and it goes back to what I said in The Legend of Zelda, is that I don't like large, expansive worlds where I can get lost easily, and I don't like island hopping. It's just something I don't prefer. Maybe it's because the world looks so empty with so much water. I don't know. Overall, I think it's beautiful, and I'm glad it makes so many players happy, but as for me... I don't know about that. Tell you what, I'll get us started. <sighs> that feels... Feels better. Ooh, the newest game in the series, and it scraped my list of the three Zelda games I don't enjoy. Now that's interesting to think about. You think this series has progressed enough, got so many positive reviews, yet I don't like it at all. Why? What went wrong? What's wrong with choosing any dungeon you'd like to play in any order? Sounds like fun. For starters, I don't like buttery graphics. It's too bland in my shelf of what graphics I prefer, and the game is too fast-paced. While I know it doesn't bother anybody else, it just means the game will get done faster in a Four Swords Adventures fashion, so the game feels more like an arcade beat-em-up zooming from one room to the next, and a true speedrun version of a Zelda game. True, the puzzles are excellent and innovation is impressive, but it feels like there's nothing to appreciate about them or anything memorable about the game if it's going to get blown over in a short amount of time. To me, the game is a progression steroid that feels like it gives the player a lot of short bursts of satisfaction, but at the sacrifice of memorability. Compared to the other Zelda games, how often are the dungeons talked about? The weapons? What about the bosses? I've checked reviews. Very little dungeons, very little weapons, very little boss talk. It's all about the mechanics. And that's what people want. The next issue is renting weapons. And I think personally that this is a very stupid idea. Part of the suspense for me from a Zelda game is to wander into a dungeon wondering what the item is going to be. And well, since you can rent weapons, you can get from point A to point Z in a dungeon in a flash without any trouble. And for me, that just ruins dungeons. There's nothing holding you back from finishing them in a fast fraction of the time that dungeons normally do from other games. On its pluses, it definitely dishes out the freedom to any passing Zelda player playing it, and the dungeons are well prepared for a lot of solutions, but for me the game is too easy, it's too short, it's too beatable, and in my blunt opinion, it drifted too far from Zelda's expectations in my book. But just in mind, you'll see everyone else's is quite different from my story. The big disappointment behind Four Swords is that it's required multiplayer, at least in the GBA port and I know there are more recent ways you can access the game. However, it's only worth playing the game if you have a friend or two with you, and I'll recall my experiences from playing this game a decade ago. I think of this game more like a minigame, and it's designed that way. It's something that can casually be done in about an hour, and in no doubt the game is fun. I mean, you're playing Zelda with a friend, so it definitely has its perks. But there's no denying that because it can be done in a quiet afternoon with your friends, it'll become the most unmemorable thing you've done in video games. And it became just that for me. The game, it was okay, but because it's so short, there's not really anything that'll stick with you from this game when thinking about Zelda games. I like The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask a lot. I like the concept behind this game, a dark storyline using a bunch of masks to use a bunch of control schemes, and as far as I'm concerned, those are pulled off wonderfully, and I love those. Despite the things I'm going to say next, I do go back to play Majora's Mask from time to time because it is a great game. Now, it's not a secret since it's at number 13 that there's a big wrench getting thrown in the gears here. Let's start with the obvious and work our way down to the more detailed stuff. To start, I don't like that the game took the route to be four dungeons with a lot of side quests. 
I would have liked it a lot better if the side quests were kept to a minimum and had 8 dungeons instead. To me anyways, this is like playing a Mario game stripped down to 4 worlds, or a Sonic game stripped to 4 zones, or a Pokemon game with only 4 gym leaders. The game doesn't feel complete. What worries me about Majora's Mask is that it sacrificed some of its adventuring formula for the feeling formula. When I hear reviews about this game, it's usually focused on the tenseness of the situation when the moon is coming, and that the overwhelming atmosphere of the game justifies it as a Zelda game. But it doesn't for me. I think it's great there's a timer on the bottom to keep things tense, but when it comes to a museum of pushing the A button to see what people say over getting more temples, I'm not a huge fan of that. Another thing that bothers me is the end result of these side quests. It comes packed with a lot of satisfaction and feelings like it's promised, but in each one, the three day cycle repeats itself, meaning it ends up becoming a what if situation with a cute trophy attached to saying you did it. But did what? Your efforts have been erased and the person ended up not being helped at all. Two more things with the first being that the game isn't very clear where you should go or what to do. The magic bean guy and where to use the magic beans gooped me up when I was a kid, the Goron Mountain really tied up my patience, the water one was okay, and I've never been to the last one because of the last problem. The save system is unreliable. I played through the game 5 times and never got to the stone temple, even today, because the save file randomly deletes itself when it wants to even when following its rules, at least in my case. Remember me saying I had to go through all that time figuring out what to do next? Having spent so much time and saves going through the game, it had plenty of opportunities to delete the file if it didn't work right. But it's all preferences. I understand that a lot of Zelda players enjoy more atmosphere in their adventure, but for me it's more of a focus on heading out there into the world to find the next dungeon. And when the game tries to shake my shoulder and say I can fix this problem, but which I can't due to time travel, sorry Majora's Mask but no cute trophy for you, at least from me anyways. Otherwise I think it's a great game and there are a lot of things I enjoyed about it and I don't hate it. The dungeons were fun, the masks were awesome, and there was a lot of exploration like every Zelda game promises. But every time I thought about those awesome things like dungeons that pulled off spectacularly in this game, I kept thinking it would have been cool to see more of that potential. Overall, awesome, but it's at number 13 for a reason. Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword it introduced two main features, and it turns out the only problems I have with the game happens to be with those two things. Let's clear out the easier one to tackle, it's motion controls. I think the motion controls range from good to excellent, but I felt them unnecessary. I understand, once it's a Wii game and the video game designers have this OCD to put in as much exercise with video games as possible, it's only natural for it to happen with Zelda someday. Games may age, but I don't want them to in this way in my opinion. I've always been happy with two hands and two thumbs on a controller. If Skyward Sword made a GameCube controller compatible, I would have liked the game a hundred times more and I wish they had thought of it. Now the other feature is the story. Whew, boy, what do I think of the story? Well, uh, uh. If you want my blunt, honest opinion, I think they tried too hard to get me to like it, and for that it took me out of the experience. For example, when I met Zelda, I knew they were going for the sweet, lovable, innocent, non-princess version of Zelda. But to be honest, I thought she was a jerk. First off, when she pushed me off the edge, the way she did it seemed like the game was trying to make me think, oh, she's so innocent and sweet, and here I was thinking, really? Did you really just do that? Did you just push me off at my possible life's expense just to look cute? She saves me and the game tries to sugar it by saying, aw, she's caring for her bird. And I'm thinking, you could have avoided that and oh, thanks for not checking if I'm okay. The next part is when she gets concerned for you over passing your test, pretty much stabbing your confidence left and right because that's what friends do, not. The game wants me to say character development is so sweet and here I'm wanting to say, I really hate you Zelda. I'm sorry guys, but I legitimately hate this Zelda. She pushes her friend off to her death at my life's expense for her amusement just to look cute and pulls a 180 on her caring attitude to belittle my confidence. So by the time she was carried off, I was like, please take her away, far away. The problem I had with the story was that the story wanted me to rub its feelings all over my face and say, here, you're supposed to feel this way because I'm doing this for the first time and I'm cool for doing it. It may not be a big deal to you, I understand that, but I've been depressed once that started from things like this in real life, and having experience with this stuff here for several years, I can instantly pick up when someone's trying to rub feelings in my face. Is this the game's fault to set this off? Of course not. It's just me, so I don't hate it. 
but it does send up red flags on my mind so it does affect me nonetheless when I play the game. I'd be lying to you if I said I was perfectly okay with it. Past with Zelda disappearing and Fee showing up, I was like, finally, let's start this adventure. And the game started to pick up drastically, so the story wasn't a big deal. Thankfully, the game didn't focus too much on Zelda, Groose, Girahim, or Fee who pretty much wrecked the experience every time I encountered them. But otherwise, I thought the game was pretty cool. The temples were great, I wish the items were more creative, but what the heck, it's a fun Zelda game, and it's lived up to its name really well. One last problem is that the game is surprisingly linear, which I think is rather interesting since from the first Legend of Zelda game, it was the complete opposite which says something about its reputation today. I didn't mind since I play linear games all the time, but it's something to note when playing this and the exploration is in no way stands out in this game compared to its older children in the family. It's pretty bland in my opinion. So yeah, other than the motion controls and horrendous story where I wanted to punch every main character in the face I came across, I enjoyed the game very much and recommend it. But thankfully not the temples and music were distracting enough from those flaws for me to thoroughly enjoy it. And I did. I liked it a lot. that specifically appealed to me and what I like in video games from Link's Awakening is the charm, the music, and how creative it is. In fact, I'd be bold enough to call it one of the more creative and imaginative games in the series, but that's my opinion. I remember playing this game for the first time, picking up an acorn and thinking this. Wow, now that's cute. I like it. What impresses me about this game is the detail to show off something new to the Zelda player. It feels like every time you scroll over to the next panel that something interesting happens that intrigues me, like a person singing. At some moments I notice, wow, the panel got darker and hey, there's a witch in this house. This game invites so much exploration and curiosity out of you, which is what makes it so great as an adventure game. The next thing I'm doing, I'm taking a chain chomp out for a walk and then the next I'm breaking down a floor out of a building. It feels like wherever I go, I keep getting surprised with something so creative where a simple Game Boy could pull off that it oozes the satisfaction of an adventure and the unexpected. Now why at number 11 if it gives off the promised package of a very promising Zelda adventure? It's the music. While I like the randomness, for me at a lot of points it gets a little distracting sometimes and doesn't seem to want to sit still. Music is a great way to immerse me into the game, but then you get the oddball pieces that seem to suck my enjoyment out the window. But this is just me and music happens to be something I'm picky about if it doesn't behave, that's all. Music does mean a lot to me in a video game, it truly does. But I recommend this game, it's underrated, it needs to get out there more. Everyone watching this, please check it out. It really is an adventure that shouldn't be overlooked and a true gem in the series. don't have any problems with Adventure of Link being the second game in the series with being a side-scroller. The NES was full of side-scrollers and the developers wanted to try it out and see what would happen. Obviously, it didn't work out right if they didn't use it again, and I respect their choice to branch out a little bit to see what works and what doesn't. So aside from its history, what do I think of this game? I have to admit, I've never gotten more satisfaction out of killing enemies in this game than from other Zelda games. You can feel the rush of satisfaction out of killing every difficult thing in this game. During the first hour, I hated this game. And then you start to get the hang of the mechanics and it's a bundle of fun to play. The constant rush of doing difficult things compels you to keep leveling up with Link and to keep pressing forward. And it's addicting to wanting to complete it. I actually only have one big complaint in this game and for those who played it, they know where this is going. Link has three lives so every time he dies he respawns back at the start of the passage you died in. Sweet! So far so good. And then comes the blasted game over screen that forces you all the way back to the beginning of the game as one of the most rage inducing things in video game history where you have to hike back where you last left off. Even me as a patient person, it heats up a person's insides really fast. Otherwise, I think the game is really fun. I'm glad that it exists. It's a very satisfying side-scrolling game, but that game over screen can sure be one of the biggest killjoys you'll ever see in video game history. And I'm no different. It sucks to lose progress. But because I'm a retro gamer, love impossible challenging games to death like Battletoads and Ninja Gaiden, love side-scrollers, and I love the Zelda formula they kept in this, like temples, exploration, and a great sense of adventure. It truly is that for me. The game invites me forward where many refuse and I say, bring it. Let's do this.
Like Adventure of Link, Phantom Hourglass is considered another experimental game in its own right. Trying things out with the DS features, and I agree with some of the critics. The puzzles were a little lackluster, there's not a huge standout feature that makes me say, Phantom Hourglass is so cool because, well, uh... It seemed to be too standard of a game to really stand out in this series. This is just my opinion, some agree with me, some don't, and that's fine. So why do I like it? This is going to sound weird, but I liked the game a lot because it was mellow. The music wasn't loud like the usual Zelda game, instead it was quiet and calm. The sound effects behind swinging the sword weren't exaggerated, instead it was normal. The story wasn't huge, instead it was a little light. To be honest, this was very refreshing, and I loved it because it was underwhelming. The game felt more realistic and immersive in that way. So what, I like realistic games? Games? No! I like them being random and way out there, but it felt refreshing after about 10 Zelda games for a game to take a break from going so out there and for it to kick its leg rest up that I appreciate how different this game is for it. Just like Wind Waker with how it took its surprising turn for the graphics that everyone appreciates, I appreciate this game for its different overall feel, and for it, I like it a lot. favorite star in a story in a Zelda game, along with one other. To have Princess Zelda pull a Princess Jasmine just to come hang out with Link. It makes me feel, wow! She snuck out of her castle to come see her friend. She snuck past guards, probably got away from Impa, now this is a friend, and I want to hang out with her. P.S. I like Rebels, so this is my bias for liking her, but heck, it's my opinion. She is my best friend, so let's head to the carnival. Now, I think there are two small negatives in this game for me. Compared to the other Zelda games, I don't prefer its graphics 100%. It's not bad, but I'm saying in comparison to the other Zelda entries, it didn't stand out as much. The other thing is that the Minish Cap item to go small is a little gimmicky for me. It was cool to shrink small, don't get me wrong, but it did get old after a while, and it's not an idea that kept the game revolutionary for me. Besides, Four Swords did do this first, so yeah, not exactly original. Otherwise, I think it's awesome. There are just so many neat things like putting a boss back together, the beautiful music and dungeon designs, and there are just so many unique things to this game that it kept my attention throughout, and I like it a lot, and I'm glad this game is around. What? You want more? Well, it's like taking a nature walk at which this game emphasizes, and I can talk to you more about it, but it's more you have to play through it to understand what I'm talking about. Words can't quite cut what the experience is like. Yeah, definitely try it out. It's definitely worth it. about A Link to the Past is that it's one of the oldest games in the series but I have no nostalgia with it. I haven't played this game until around a decade ago when I was around 15 years old, so I was late to playing it. So what's funny about it? Well, it's just that I don't need nostalgia to appreciate how complete this game is. So what do I mean by complete? Every Zelda game is complete, isn't it? Well, that's because A Link to the Past does something completely awesome that does something to keep on being awesome to keep me from putting down the controller. Like I finish a puzzle then think, wow, that was a really great puzzle. I get into a group fight with enemies and say, wow, that was really thought out. And then I find a boss and say, wow, that was a really challenging fight and I loved it. If there's one thing I appreciated from A Link to the past and what I like from video games in general is its extreme challenge and I love it a lot more for it. It's everything you get from the satisfaction of beating a tough game but yet the game doesn't feel unfair like it did with Adventures of Link. You get the satisfaction without the frustration. Plus the game was pulling in original concepts to keep it fresh left to right and the exploration was done really well. I enjoyed it a lot. This in the world map is perfect for me in navigation without it being too easy, to give me a general direction and where to go but doesn't go knee deep in the specifics. Plus the game was extremely long and it didn't feel redundant at any point. It kept consistently at a steady rate it promised from the start to the finish. Now believe it or not I do have a negative for this title. Because I don't have nostalgia for it and it's a really big game or at least it feels that way, I don't think about this game often or in thinking of replaying it again because it's so long. So I've only beaten it once and almost twice. Rest assured, I had a blast going through it, but to me the game doesn't feel too replayable to me, but I do respect how much fun it gave to me going through it at the time. Think of it like Donkey Kong 64. It's an extremely long game, and despite that you probably love it to death, it's hard to replay it because it's so big. 
A Link to the Past is a perfect game I can't find a flaw in. It wraps its balance around everything that can be done right in a Zelda game. It's a nicer paced game where you can't help but appreciate everything in sight and it doesn't rush you through it. It's a game where you can take your time and remember it for what it's great for. Now is the time where I'm going to scare the heck out of you. Now everyone has their gifts with video games, you have some, so do I. As you can tell from my 288 Zelda bosses, it's obvious my patience is rather unnatural. Why is this relevant to this game? Well, most people look at this game and think it has to be connected to Zelda principles to qualify it for a good Zelda game, but my patience doesn't cross that thought. Instead, it skips every expectation in the series and looks forward to what makes it a great video game for me to sit down and enjoy. So this is what my mind does when it comes to Cross Four Swords Adventures. It thinks, cool, I like Zelda a lot and I like arcade beat-em-ups a lot. Plus, add on that I have a really soft spot for video games that try something different, I was hooked. I knew I was going to go all out on this game and get it done in a few days because it was really fun and it truly was a blast to play. What I like about this game is that it knows its identity as a multiplayer game and sticks with it as an expansion pack to Four Swords. It's not puzzle heavy, which keeps things consistent to keep the flow of the game going nicely. Usually in multiplayer games like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, Streets of Rage, and Contra, the fun of the game isn't in taking in your surroundings, which usually happens with single player. Instead, it focuses on having fun with your friends with the amount of mischief and fun you get into to make it that much more enjoyable and have a blast playing it. Fortunately, I've had the privilege to play this game with a few friends, and it's like Super Smash Bros. and Mario Kart. The game is cool on its own, no doubt, but it becomes exponentially better when you play it as it's supposed to be as a party game. I guarantee that single player junkies will not appreciate this title as much because you need two players at least to get its blood flowing to what makes it a wonderful addition to the series. Now the only downside I have to this game is that there were one or two parts in the game like the graveyard and this village that dragged on forever because I couldn't figure out what to do next. Wandering around one or two areas for a few moments is not fun, but thankfully it wasn't common. Even so, I still put it at number 6. Four Swords Adventures, the world won't love you, but you'll always have my love and nostalgia for you whenever we're reunited. The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Seasons is the rocket ship of the series. At first, it's unimpressive. The world doesn't feel big and populated. The story's too short and straightforward. The bosses are remakes from the original Legend of Zelda with too little improvements. The dungeons are like empty storage rooms. Take your pick. It's the slowest Zelda game to start up, and then around the third dungeon, blast off! The game not only jumps around to meet you and shake your hand enthusiastically, but also starts to reinvent good classic Zelda fun with its share of giving you really fun toys to play with. The world of Subrogia becomes more interesting and fascinating the more you explore it. The dungeons feel very unique to the exclusive items found in the dungeon. And let me tell you, it takes it the whole nine yards in how that plays out. Even the bosses, though some of them are remakes, they don't feel like remakes with how beautifully they're executed. I can never brag enough, especially the eighth and final dungeon at which is arguably one of the best dungeons in the Zelda series I've ever seen. Really creative, fun music, it was a joy. Two tiny negatives for me. Usually I don't mind that there's snow or some story in video games, but this one is noticeably non-existent for a Zelda game. The bad guy takes the girl, then you fight him at the end, the end. Yep, you never see him again in between that time, unless you count a moment of empty gloating. Picture Ocarina of Time with a story like that. It's just something that irks you somewhat that they could have put more pieces in to make the journey more worth your time. The last one is The Rod of Seasons. It's unimpressive to me. It made the puzzles involving seasons just a simple flick and switch and ta-da! Problem solved. I'm sorry, and that is my opinion. I didn't get into the item at all and didn't see its appeal. Otherwise, for anyone wanting to try this out, grit your teeth for the slow start and be patient. The first couple of dungeons aren't big, so sweep through them, then you'll join the rest of us who adore Oracle of Seasons. For the hidden potential it had to make it an excellent Zelda game that truly does hold its magic for its own share of fun.
Just like Four Swords Adventures, Spirit Tracks got a few twitches from Zelda players hearing about this game because of its train concept. And like Four Swords Adventures, the reason I like the game is the same reason I like Spirit Tracks is because it puts the formula into a chokehold to try something new and innovative. And well, we know gamers, Zelda has to be the same, I have to travel on foot for it to be a good Zelda game or get me there faster for it to be enjoyed. You are probably skeptical about it. And also it comes back to preferences. Some people like it and some people don't. And I understand that. It's not meant for everybody. So like Minish Cap, I like this story and how it started, in that Zelda puts in some extra effort to try being your friend, and it works out well and like how Link goes on these adventures with the ghost Zelda. It makes for a sense of friendship development and working with the problem at hand for them to become better friends throughout the game. Now the big one, what about the trains? It's the combination of the immersion and the unknown that stands out about it. For example, you go into the woods or a blizzard or a cave and can't see your map so all you hear is your train going chugga 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 as you look ahead to explore around in it. Unlike going up foot where you can go faster and slower, you stay at a steady rate and the junctions pinch an added sense of involvement. Okay, enough about trains. What do I think of the gameplay? The blowpipes are my favorite instrument in the series. The dungeons were upped a lot more due to the tag team with Zelda and I mean a lot more from Phantom Hourglass. The fighting and item mechanics worked out really well and were very creative. And that's pretty much it. And how the game went into a smooth transition of progress, it wasn't distracting in anything it was doing to keep me from enjoying the game. It's a masterpiece of creativity with keeping to what makes Zelda so special with its elements. At this point in the countdown, I can't really find a negative with the game that distracts me away from the massive positives. It just so happens that the farther entries in this list had more braming positives. But Spirit Tracks is still a game I'd take a train ticket to for my enjoyment from the franchise. Haha, uh -huh, you were hoping. This is the first Zelda game I've ever played, finished, and have beat this game more than any other Zelda game. I think I've beaten it a total of 10 times. I think that goes to show how much I like the game, but to be honest, I don't think this Zelda game has aged well for me. It feels like other than being easy enough for the first time player to try out, along with this nostalgia and first to 3D transition, this game doesn't stand out compared to the other Zelda titles. But that could be because I've beaten the game so many bloody times, its novelty is worn out with me. That's what I thought at first when ranking this, however, as I was ranking this list and putting this entry higher and lower, I started getting hesitant because when comparing this directly with other Zelda games, this one does hold a special place with me, and I wonder what would have seriously happened to my Zelda life if Ocarina of Time didn't exist. So I dug in deep, deep, deep within myself between my long-winded career I retired from and my nostalgia aside to find out what makes this game stand out. And I think Ocarina of Time is inviting. It invites you into its environment. It invites you to try out its simple concepts. It's the best Zelda game that potentially lets you know how enjoyable Zelda games can be. So the only reason an Ocarina of Time is at number 3 is that it's generally all over the place with its positives. But the next two entries are catered more to what I absolutely love from video games specifically and Zelda games. For example, I love challenge in video games, but can you say Ocarina of Time is the most challenging game in the series? Uh, no. From this day on, I've sworn off Ocarina of Time along with Super Mario 64, Donkey Kong 64, and Banjo-Kazooie. There's just this point that you squeeze a fruit dry, then twist it in your hands to squeeze more out, then crush it in half to get more out. And someday, you've slowly got to let your fingers go and say, I'll remember you. Thanks for the fun times back then. Shocker. I keep bragging about Twilight Princess and it didn't reach my number one spot. Hmm. Everyone has their 3D Zelda game that's their lifelong buddy like from Majora's Mask, Skyward Sword, Wind Waker, and my 3D buddy is Twilight Princess that blows my world. It's interesting because I hear all the time on the internet things like Wind Waker is picked on from the internet for its graphics and Twilight Princess for its oh it's ripped off of Majora's Mask. 
but don't think the game you happen to like is universally hated. Twilight Princess has its fans and dislikes just the way it is. Wind Waker has its fans and dislikes just the way it is. I am not the only one that likes Twilight Princess out of the four, and I do know some have their shares of avoiding it. And that's just fine. It's all on your preferences and there's nothing weird about them. It's who you are and what you like from your video games. I already expanded quite a bit from the countdown why I like Twilight Princess, but I'll dig down to the core of why I like this game. It's the flow and originality of the game. Just like Link's Awakening, one event happens one after another that makes me get immersed into it. So much so that it feels like I'm in a true Zelda movie. This is a game where I like Link the most, just simply because his facial expressions make me feel like for the first time that he is a real person. In fact, I wished he actually talked to compliment that, but that's just me. Midna was the coolest tag along character and I like how she develops a humble attitude towards Link later on. I love the puzzles and how the items were creatively used. I like the dark atmosphere for the game. Again, just a preference of mine, but I like the whole premise of it and where it was going along with the wolf. I loved how each dungeon just melted my eyes with how detailed it was. It's just like, oh. I loved it, and I know plenty other than me love it, and if you don't, that's fine. Twilight Princess isn't for everyone, and I acknowledge that. But for me, it's the slice of pie out of the four that fits my flavor of fun. Just, this game is one of my all-time favorite video games in existence. That's because I fanned out everything perfectly in what I like in video games. The story is short but has depth to keep to the gameplay. It's not too easy or too hard to figure out what to do next. The world and dungeon design is top-notch. The items, especially the mermaid suit that really jumped the expectations in that category. The bosses are really original and challenging. The flow between one dungeon to the next kept my sense of adventuring at the brim. The environments and its surprising elements were really thought out and creative. The time changing mechanic was the best feature because it made the game world two entire worlds into one. Just like A Link to the Past, there are two worlds. While I'm on that, the music is top notch in how it works with the present and the past and at the current situation going on right now. The amount of detail between the two worlds is scary at how similar and at how different they are. You could tell it was the same location, but yet there was something completely different happening on the the other side. It made exploring rather fun and rather tricky at times and I enjoyed the challenge to find where everything was. For example, when you come across the second dungeon in the present, you accidentally break the dungeon. So the game tells you to go back to the past to look for it again and enter it. Now that's a twist! When heading for the third dungeon, you lose your items and it comes out with an ingenious trading system to get you thinking a bit. Up to the fourth dungeon leads to one of the most depressing moments I've seen in the Zelda series. As for the sixth dungeon, you sneaky goose. As for the villain, Thanks for being a threat throughout the game unlike Onyx who thinks sitting is a threat. I wish the Oracle games weren't underrated or treated as the same games because Oracle of Seasons and the Oracle of Ages are entirely different stories and games other than the control scheme and a few items but I found a lot more fun and fulfillment from the Oracle of Ages than I do from the Seasons. I hope more gamers do try it out and I can see how some could not like it but for me it's my favorite Zelda game and closed in all the gaps to what makes a great video game adventure for me. Mm -hmm.